Hi, my name is Alex M., and I'm an alcoholic. Oh, wait a minute. Sorry, wrong meeting. Okay. I'm sorry, that's about as much as you're going to get for like fancy images, graphics. I was trying to get the, the um, exploding van from the uh, recent Fox News thing, but I couldn't get that as a, as a swipe in um, open office. Okay, um, this is basically a nuts and bolts kind of boring guide to protecting your stuff from, well, people like me. Um, and I'm really impressed that there are that many people that are here for like another you know, hour of what I'm, like to, what I'm gonna have to call DEF CON Law School. Um, okay, standard disclaimer. Uh, I'm a lawyer. I'm not your lawyer. Um, unless you give me some money and I'm very receptive to that. Um, topic, topics presented today reflect my personal views and not necessarily those of OnSite 3, my employer. Okay, this talk is not legal advice, it's educational and hopefully some entertainment purposes. Uh, the important thing in this is this field of law is in flux. What is good today may not protect you in a week. So it's, it's changing really fast and it's changing in kind of scary ways. There are people who are now facing jail time for stuff that their lawyer could have perfectly honestly said, yeah, this is legal. So just to be, you know, be worried. Be worried. Uh, local laws vary. Contents may settle during shipping. Okay, this is kind of a. This comes from a, a drunken conversation at a pump con a couple of years ago, where I was trying to explain uh, unsuccessfully that what I do for a living is not social engineering. After all, I spent three years, a um, hundred thousand dollars, and I passed two stupid exams. That mean that when I, you know, threaten somebody with something, it's not social engineering; it's something else. And um, I'm wrong. Actually, it is social engineering. But it's the because this was someone who's saying like, "Look, you can't hack my boxes. They're incredible." I'm like, you know what? Not only can I hack your boxes, I can make you help me. I want this information, and I don't want to look for it. Give it to me. Like, how can you do it? Subpoena. But thinking about it, like, wait a minute, let's go further into this. If you, and then he got very scared. It's like, wait a minute, think of these attacks as any other attack, as, you know, someone is trying to get your stuff. Someone's trying to make you do something or do something to you in a way, and that made sense to him. Like, wait a minute, you know, just think of these as more new attacks, like breaking stuff. I can uh, do a destructive search warrant against your systems. Um, or I can, you know, root your box and then erase everything. But both of those are equally, both of those are annoying. Both of those mean that you're gonna have a, you know, a down, you know, we're down for temporary maintenance, sorry, for a little while. Um, shutdown. An injunction will do the same thing as a pretty good DOS attack. Um, and also, similar precautions will let you prepare for the sort of stuff that people like me or people like John Benson will do to your systems. Um, good off-site backups aren't just for disaster recovery. They're also for what happens if you get a destructive search warrant that takes half your systems out. Um, strong searching and archiving. Um, Full disclosure here, I, I try to force people on this when I do consulting work. It's often, do you have an archiving solution? Because that makes civil litigation, which is what I do, much, much easier. So I'm going to talk about four basic kinds of legal attacks today. Two criminal, uh, search warrants and wiretaps, and then subpoenas and discovery, civil litigation. And then if I have, still have time, I'm going to talk about transit of trust. Okay, starting with search warrants. And I put this in every damn talk I've got because I want people to remember this. This is like the one bastion of civil liberties we have left this week. Because um, this gets nibbled away every single day. And, and if, we don't, if you guys don't know what this is and what this means, they'll take it from you. They'll ta and by taking it from you, they take it from me. So... Rights of the people to be secure in, in their persons, houses, and eh, we don't care about that, papers and effects. That is your data. Against unreasonable searches. It does not protect against all searches, just unreasonable ones. And no warrants shall issue, but upon probable cause, magical words. Unfortunately, we don't know what those mean. Uh, 
supported by oath or affirmation, and of particularly describing the place to be searched and persons or things to be seized. That is the, that's what we've built search warrants around. Now, how do we do search warrants in the United States? You have to have a, a judge or a neutral judicial officer, usually in the federal system, a magistrate, a lesser judge, who determines that there is probable cause that a crime occurred and that the persons named are evidence that I'm looking for, that the officer is looking for, is within the place to be searched. It has to be signed in a written affidavit from the law enforcement officer who is attesting to the probable cause, and it has to be particular. It has to say, I am looking for, say for example, child pornography. Um, where it is, or where it is likely to be found, so they limit the search. It can't just be all through the continental United States. It can be your data center, if probable cause exists that your data center is housing child pornography. Now, a warrant allows the things named in the warrant. I'm looking for all evidence of child pornography held by ISP X. So it can allow the seizure of contraband, the evidence, fruits, and instrumentalities of that crime found during the search, even if it's not in the warrant. Um, if they find, say, you know, the, the, the typical example is, I'm looking for child porn, and I open a door looking for a computer, and I find a kilo of coke and, and five submachine guns, the officer can say, well, those are mine too now. Because I've walked in like, hey, there's more evidence of crime. Now, for computers containing evidence, containing fruits and instrumentalities of crime, there's an interesting question. What does that allow seizure of? Is that seizure of the data thereon or the computers? That is a question you're going to hit if you're a sysadmin, network administrator, you run a knock, something like that. If they have a warrant to come and say, we're here to seize data, under the current protocols, it is up to the law enforcement officer to decide, I'm going to get a copy of your data or I'm deracking your server. This is important when it's 3 in the morning, there are armed men in your knock that don't work for you, and they want your boxing. So thinking about this as, you know, like a DOS attack or something, it's noisy and destructive. You don't get warning on this. It's, or if you're unlucky, oh, dude, there are guys with guns here. What do you do? And really it's, um, as little as possible. Um, a no-knock warrant can be granted if the police can articulate re a suspicion that you will despoil evidence. Evidence will go away if there's any warning. Um, there are no immediate defenses. Thinking of this as you can prepare for the attack, what do you do during the attack, what do you do after the attack? During it, you cannot make it better. Um, you can make it a hell of a lot worse. So, and I want to, it's, it's a problem of, you have to play it very, you have to play it right, but you're in a very dangerous position. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, what you're afraid of is what I like to call collateral damage that is unintentional. Um, I've read a few affidavits of, or not really affidavits, I've read a few interviews of people who are running knocks or running systems, and I don't want to insult any law enforcement officers in the audience, but... And I've talked to a few that have done search warrants, and oftentimes they act dumber than they are because it's a great advantage. I'm here to get the server, and they have the biggest, most intimidating goon with the biggest, ugliest set of bolt cutters. Now, imagine I'm going to go derack a server with four-foot bolt cutters. You're thinking, oh my god, these guys are going to make such a mess of my knock. They're, gonna, like, they're, they're not even going to unbolt something. They're going to cut through the rails. Now, as as you know, a sysadmin, you're thinking they're gonna, oh, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a mess. Fine, the server you want's over there. You just did something. You just admitted that you knew something. Now it doesn't matter if they wanna, but you've you've opened a door. Um, so you have to play this cool. You have to be as dumb as possible, yet you have to limit the search. So how do you prepare for the search warrant? First off. Um, if you're anticipating getting hit with search warrants where it's a question of they're going to derack your servers or they're just going to take the data, um, I like multiple site data and, and systems backup, uh, preferably in multiple jurisdictions if possible, and automatic failover. If they execute a warrant when you're not there and they just take your systems, you know, like, huh, 
the Cleveland Colo seems to be down. It's nice to be able to shunt to San Francisco or Amsterdam or wherever. Now, that's the, the, just the purely IT defenses. The legal defenses. It's minimizing the damage during the warrant execution. You are lucky enough to be the, the, the guy or gal in the knock where there are you know, men waving guns and bolt cutters around. You have a choice. You can be helpful or you can be passive. Uh, one good case study is AOL. If you have a search warrant, AOL has a division or a department that executes search warrants. You fax the search warrant, they give you the data. And the advantage is l law enforcement officers like dealing with that because it's, it's easy. I don't actually have to get up or do anything. I just say, uh, here's the search warrant, here's what I want, and they go, and, you know, do you want that in DVD, CD, or DAD? You know, and, and it's an advantage for, for AOL to play that way because it's, you know, it's just like, oh, it's a business cost. It's not significant. If you're a smaller ISP or you're a little bit more aggressive about civil liberties, um, you may, they, the police then kind of can fall back and say, we can take all your servers. So you're in kind of this weird gray area. Now, if you are in that gray area and the police are deciding we're going to get a little bit more aggressive, don't interfere. Don't touch the cop. Don't get in his way. Don't refuse. Don't say I'm calling my lawyer. It doesn't matter. You call me, my response is going to be, don't touch him. In fact, stay the hell away. Watch. Bring witnesses in to watch what happens. Don't say shit. In fact, shut the fuck up. Um, I, I, the criminal defenses I have done, I, I've done one child porn possession case where we would have had pretty good shot at. I don't think of quitting him, but we could have nailed. A, we could have knocked a couple charges off of him, except that he not only signed a confession, he went through and initialed and signed every page of a twenty-two page chat log about what he did, like. Dude, you are a tool. You walked, you're, it's like, well, can you get me off on this? No, no, no. Um, um, it's like, well, I can't go to jail. Don't worry. They'll, ri they'll give you a ride. You know, they'll, they'll take you to jail. Don't worry. They, 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 you don't have to go find the way. They'll, they're not letting you go. <sighs> now, the important part is don't let the scope expand. If they have a search warrant that says we want all the data from customer A on server X, you know that customer A is actually on servers X, Y, and Z. You don't want to be helpful in this case. Because, and, and one case, and this is something that's been bugging me, because I've been thinking about this hypothetical. You are a colo, because that's one of my jobs. I'm a sysadmin at a, a web hosting company, and I don't know what all my customers are doing. Because I, I don't know what, you know, I, I don't know, unless I actually look at all their websites, if they're hosting child porn. Now, my fear is that because I remember passwords, even those that aren't my own, I don't want to ever say, oh, you can't get into that system, the password is blah, blah. All of a sudden, I've gone from just being the guy at the knock to I have knowledge and control of that box that holds child porn. All of a sudden, I became more interesting. And that's not something you want to be. So don't let the scope expand. Don't point to new machines. Say, what machines are you looking for? Good. There it is, there it is, there it is. Here's a screwdriver. Can I power it down for you? Now, cleaning up afterwards. This is the big part. Um, legally, someone like me can try to exclude evidence. Now, excluding evidence is where you've been, you, you are now a magical term called defendant. Really not a place to be. Um, so you can say, if we can argue that the, the warrant is invalid, it was improperly executed, um, or that consent was not freely and openly given. Um, see, that's why I talk about don't let the scope expand. If you say, oh, in that box or stuff, may I look? Often your answer should be no. Because th that's how most, most, of the, most of the drug cases I've worked on, that's how they get them. Do you mind if I look in your trunk? Sure! If you're carrying two kilos of heroin, the trunk is no. No, really. You know, <laughs> well, we're, you know, we're, well, we're going to bring drug dogs. Fine. Because at least then if you don't open the trunk and go, what's that? Because you're not going to, once you've done that, you're not talking your way out of anything. Bob put that in there. No, 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 no. If it's, I, I 
you know, the, if, if it's, well, we got a warrant, we open the trunk, and there's two kilos of heroin. And you go, I'm never renting another car from Avis again. <laughs> okay. Um, so, you know, going back, shut the fuck up. Okay, cleaning up afterwards, IT. Cut over to another site if you can. Restore from backup. Think of this as disaster recovery and go back to work. Okay, yeah. Ooh, well, wait a minute, no, because you have, you're backing up from tapes. Okay, oh, I'm sorry. Um, the gist does, uh, if you've got backup tapes of what may be exculpatory evidence, do you restore from those? I think yes, because the tapes aren't changing. You, keep, you, you make an archive of those tapes, hold those aside, and if you're the defendant, you... You know, usually though, I think if you're a defendant, your you know your bigger trouble is not going to jail versus getting the site back up. If you're the ISP of the defendant, you you know, <laughs> hey, sorry, Bob. Um, yeah, I think we can let you out of your contract because you're in jail now. Yeah, you know, that that's that's your biggest concern. Okay, uh, there are warrantless searches, which are there isn't a warrant. The cops want to look at your stuff anyway. There are exceptions. Search incident lawful arrest. If you're picked up outside of here and you're carrying something you shouldn't, if, they, if, the, if the arrest for something else is valid, they can search you. Anything found on you is coming in as evidence. Automobile searches. Now, this comes in um, with the regulatory searches. If they find there are a couple cases of people crossing national borders with laptops containing contraband, namely child porn. That's like the big contraband. Um, there are two different cases saying, yes, they can. They can, they can, they can do a forensic image of your machine because you you're going into Canada. No probable cause, no nothing. There's another case saying, no, that's bullshit. So right now, if you are carrying stuff that would get you in trouble, be careful. Um, probably don't cross the border with it at least not on you. If I mean, one, one one that came up during another conference, someone threw out FedEx it on DVD, like, okay, I kind of like that, just not to your own name. Um, the more interesting one is exigent circumstances. I'm an emergency. It's something that I don't have time to get a warrant to make this happen. Um, Heckenkamp is out of, I want to say Minnesota, but I might be wrong. Uh, IT staffer, uh, just hacks into uh, a computer attached on the network, uh, of a university doesn't delete anything but just kind of makes a note of the directories to say I think this is this machine has this folder structure doesn't take any data off of it it's still technically a violation of uh, uh, 1030 the computer fraud and abuse act but they let the data come in for uh, uh, for a conviction against Heckenkamp so they do allow some searches now that's a search done by a third party not by a government agency the rules change if it's you know Joe Bob versus the feds uh, one other kind of interesting uh, exception to that is the third party search if Joe Bob is not being paid by the feds asked to do something by the feds but finds evidence of a crime they can they can they can break all your shit hand it over to the feds and the feds can prosecute you based on that, or the state can prosecute you based on that. Uh, there's a Steiger case, which is really weird. It's this, um, according, to, according to the story, he's Turkish, uh, unknown hacker, breaks into a guy who has child porn on his computer, sends all the information to the FBI and says, I found all this porn. Go get the guy. And the resp uh, FBI's response is, thanks. Um, th that, that was an easy one. Um, and they, the, the guy goes to jail and says, well, wait a minute. Uh, you had someone break into my system. And, it, and the feds honestly say, he did it on his own. We didn't ask him to do that. And that's valid. That evidence is coming in. I can't get that kicked. And then there's permissive searches. And uh, permissive searches, like the guy with the two kilos of heroin in his trunk, sure, you can look in my trunk. Sure, you can look in my PC. Even if I'm borrowing your car, it's your heroin in your car, I stop, cop pop stops, can I look in the trunk? I say, sure. Heroin can be used against you. Um, I may have even had no permission to have the car in the first place. I could have stolen it. 
But because the cop didn't know that at the time, I had apparent authority to grant the search. Uh, there's a case, uh, I forget where Andrus is out of, where Dad, who knows nothing about computers, he's like a 78-year-old ophthalmologist, lets someone look at his son's computer. He doesn't even have the password. He lets them break into the system. He actually has a BIOS password. Um, there, they, I, according to the affidavit, they immediately yank the drive and encase it, which you know gets right past the BIOS password, and finds child porn. Apparent authority is enough. Cop, in good faith, however thin that is, says, I thought the guy was letting me do it. We're in. Okay. Wiretaps. Um, these are a little bit nastier because they're hidden. You don't know. You, you know when you're having a search warrant executed against you. Um, you don't know when a wiretap's executed against you. Um, Wiretap requires, uh, has to specify the target, does not have to necessarily specify a specific box. It can say all communication services used by X. Uh, it's called a roving wiretap. Um, it can only be granted when there's no, there's no less intrusive method. I can't just search his box. I can't just um, break into his house. Uh, and Kalia, unfortunately, this is what we call a, a what's known as a bare statute. There aren't many rulings on it, so I don't. We no lawyer can honestly say I know what this means. They'll they'll say nice wishy washy things like that should mean this, and it's like well, you shouldn't have gone to jail or you shouldn't have paid that fine. But I'm sorry, the judge didn't like my explanation, and you know that's why you know lawyers go home and eat, and you go home to jail. Um, so. There's a scary bit about Kalia that says it, that any data pulled from a Kalia compliant wiretap or data wiretap um, has to be transportable back to the FBI with no interference by whoever has the network facility. So it seems to be that it's an opening up for like there's a Kalia backdoor in every Kalia compliant router. Um, I'm sure some if some of you found that back door, you would keep it quiet for national security reasons. <sighs> okay. TAC profile. It's stealthy and incriminating. No one will know what's going on, and I don't even know how you'd find one. You know, if it's something as dumb as like a, a layer one, you know, it's just a, a you know, you, you're, you're replicating a port. I, I don't know how you'd find that anything's happening. Like, there's 0 0.002 more latency in this router than that router. Uh, you know, I mean, usually my response is like, bad copper. <laughs> I don't know. Um, and you won't know until after you've been charged with the crime when they're like, well, we have all this evidence. Where did that come from? Oh, shit. <laughs> there, there's us talking about the drug deal. Hmm. Um, so defenses. Uh, strong encryption with limited distribution of the keys. Um if the ISP or provider holds the keys, like, hey, we are offering you a secure VPN and we handle all of it, all of a sudden that's less secure to a wiretap because the feds can say, can I have the key? Or really, it's not really, can I? It's give me the key. Um, a grand jury can subpoena keys. Even if you're running your own, you know, you're running, you have all possession, Any anyone in between you and who you're talking to is is completely out of the loop for for your encryption. They can just show up and say we're subpoenaing your key. We want to look at your stuff. Um, and there are national security letters. And if anyone's ever had one, um, you are now allowed to show them to an attorney. I will represent you for free because I want to see one of these things. I, I'm curious if they look like you know like a Wonka gold ticket or, or you know like because they're people I, I've heard like ooh I've I've heard of them like you know like they're talking about like the Loch Ness monster like. Okay, it's a document. It's probably written in the English language. It says, give me this. Um, I I'm just curious to see one. Um, now, legal attacks to prevent a wiretap. Um, you can argue there's no, pr uh, no probable cause. The, there's some flaws in it. The information can be suppressed. If innocent communications are captured, a part of Kalia says that no innocent communications can be captured in a compliant wiretap, but it's up to the provider to make sure that no innocent communications are are captured. So I, I don't know how you do that. That's sort of like, you know, we don't know what that means yet. But uh, there are possible civil remedies. If you, 
you know, you happen to have the same ISP as Joe Drug Dealer, and they capture all your email as well, you may have some civil re remedy against them. Uh, please don't ask me about the NSA wiretapping, because I'll just start spitting profanities. Um, okay, now let's uh, get into civil stuff, which is what I do more of. Um, the criminal stuff is sexy, but the civil stuff is the bread and butter of, of what I do. Um, it's a court back order for information. You must give me stuff. Um, it's not actually a court order. It's not issued by a judge. It's issued by an officer of the court, such as me, such as a grand jury. Our regulatory agencies can often do limited subpoenas. Um, two basic types. Deuces taken, ad testificandum. Um, bring us information or let us look at stuff, or come and testify under oath. Um, violating a, t a subpoena is um, it's bad. Um, they can... Uh, they can go after you for civil contempt. They can jail you in some cases. Um, so it's really hard to kind of fight them on, I'm not doing it. You can go to a lawyer and say, help me fight this, but really on just on your own, unless you can get out of the country and you don't have any assets here, they're really hard to fight. Um, there's no right against self-incrimination in civil cases. So if there's evidence of a crime in that subpoena, you can. You have to make the choice of well. I guess I'm gonna not give it to you and say I'm taking the fifth. And you can. It can limit you in a civil case if there's both civil and criminal li litigation pending. Um, and you have to specifically say I don't want to incriminate myself. And all of a sudden it just it raises red flags. Um, there's a limit on how wide a subpoena can be. It has to be, the expense of it has to be relative to the size of the controversy. If I'm suing someone else for $10,000, I can't order a subpoena that says, give me all the emails you've ever sent. Like, clearly, that's going to be damn expensive to do. Um, also, realize that subpoenas can be used against third parties. I can go to your ISP and subpoena them for your stuff. They can say, "What's? Why are we involved?" Okay, we have to still do with that. And I don't even. I may not even have to pay them for that. They may just be out of pocket. Depends on the local laws. Some states allow it. Some states don't. Um, no privileged material, and that's limited to attorney-client, some doctor-patient, unless that's the nature of the controversy, uh, some national secret stuff. And I'm quoting from Pennsylvania law, not for harassment or, imp uh, or improper purpose, whatever that means. Um, so what's the attack profile? I like to think of that as intrusive, mysterious, and dangerous as hell. Because it, it, it can crack you wide open, and it's mysterious. What the hell do you really want? Because it, invariably you're going to write one that's broader than you need to, so you don't know really what it is you're looking for. Because you want to write it broader, expecting the other side to narrow it down. It's like negotiating for, for something. I want a $100,000 salary. Well, we'll offer you fifty, and eventually it gets to seventy-five. dollars um, can, can force you to admit incriminating facts. It's scary. You just kind of cracked wide open. Okay, defenses, IT, mitigation, easily searched indexes of all your electronic documents in the enterprise. That is harder than it sounds because it's not just your file servers. Um, recent rule changes allow any electronically stored information. That is undefined. So that could be voicemail. Yeah. Um, in a in a subpoena, they can say it, it, that, that's sort of the, the 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 space we're dealing in. Like this is all the this is ha the menu that we can order from is all electronically stored information. So you can say you know if the subpoena is more narrow, I want all email from this date to this date versus I want all electronically stored information ever generated by you. You know, one's fairly narrow, one's fairly vague. Um, And the other defense to this is a clear and followed data retention policy. You want to be able to say, we don't have that. It was destroyed. You know, we keep data for three years, and at the end of that, the, the tapes go in the shredder. The old computers get smashed. You know, old drives get burned. Um, so that way you can say, no gots. Um, this is potentially unethical, the concept of stonewalling or compartmentalization. Um, having worked at some really terrible IT shops in my past where we didn't know what existed. So one person could say, dead honestly, this is the only data we have until someone shows up with a crate of DLTs. Um, 
I, I, I was the guy that, that one day, after signing an affidavit, saying, this is all the data we have on this I, a crate of DLT shows. I'm like, what's this? <laughs> That was a that was a that was a bad week, um, and black holes where there's like what I'm talking about this crate of DLTs that I don't know where it was stored. Um, you can store information, but provided that you never ask that person where the data is. So you have like a custodian that's their job is to hide and move data. Um, legal defenses, motion to quash. You can say the subpoena is too broad. It's you're trying to get privilege information. You can't get that. Um, you can do a protective order, which is instead of quashing, eliminating subpoena entirely, it's basically a let's limit this to something that actually matters to the case that we're fighting over. Um, encryption keys and passwords may not be may not be immune to, uh, to a subpoena. Um, content of messages held by a provider under 18 U.S.C. 2510 at sequence um, can be protected um, if unless they are rel directly relevant. Yeah, is there a question? Uh, there's, okay, when I say might, it's because no judge has said yes or no. Looking at the statute, it seems to be that there's a protection, but we don't know how wide that protection is yet. So when I say may, it's because there's a statute out there that no one, ha no judge has said what it means. So that means that I as an attorney go, it might mean this, it might not, I don't know. And you know, our, our, what we'll say is, that's an interesting problem, which means um, you're going to be spending a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that means that me and someone else is going to be billing at whatever our rate is to scratch our heads about this. Scary. Um, okay, discovery. This is 95% of my day. Um, when you, it requires a filed suit. Someone is suing someone else over something. Um, it works like a subpoena against the parties of the suit. Why it's nastier than a subpoena is there's automatic disclosures. You have to determine that there's bunch... When you're sued, you just have to hand over all the relevant information. Um, what the relevant information is is up to debate. Um, if you don't hand over enough relevant information or you withhold some relative information, you may be barred from using it in court. You may be sanctioned. Um, it's it's an ugly, ugly problem because unless you negotiate with the other side to go, what, we're li we're going to limit discovery. We're going to come to some because otherwise it's just it's a free for all. It's nasty. Um, there's the automatic disclosure rule under the new federal rules of civil procedure that says you can either hand over all the locations and types of ESI that you hold that's relevant to the dispute. You can claim that we're not actually going to deliver to it. You you because it's unduly burdensome. Uh, usually this is some proportion, this is some cost-benefit analysis of it's going to cost us how much money and how much time to produce this information and how much money are we actually talking about in the suit. Um, I have dealt one, one problem uh, my company has been doing, I think we've billed maybe a quarter million dollars on this Tivoli system that uh, makes me... Um, just a, a bad, bad clusterfuck. Um, I think we've billed, you know, we're, this billing is just like vomiting money. And, like, can't we get a limitation on this? And the attorneys keep on saying, no, continue working. Like, but I don't want to. <sighs> you know, like, I'll, I'll write the order. Trust me, I'm, I'm a lawyer. I can do this. I'll write the, the quash order. And please, I'll research it for free because I don't want to look at this stuff anymore. But that's a side mark. Um, you can supplement it with additional orders against parties. Oh, I also want this. Give me that. Um, and it, what you deliver, what you disclose to the other side, has to be in the format that your organization uses. Um, I often love when, when hackers come up like, but, aha, you can do this. I'm like, no. No, you can't. Um, you know, one question was, well, what if, what if all of our ESI is in Klingon? And uh, either, you know, either the answer is, uh, that's not the form you used in business. Are you are the biggest nerd on the planet? If 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 your company, if your company's you know business language is Klingon, um, dude, that's all I gotta say. Like, like I mean, I mean, it's possible because I I've dealt with somewhere. It's like our business language is Dutch, but it's an American litigation. Like how and it's like 
And then it gets fighting and like, who's going to translate this? And it's like, well, we need to find a bunch of attorneys that speak Dutch, but that are barred in the United States. Like, okay, all 20 of them have already been hired. You know, not Dutch, but sometimes it's like, you know, even weirder languages. Um, and then get, you know, get the phone call like, hey, do you know anyone who speaks, you know, speaks Uzbek? No. <laughs> um, we need 18 of them. Uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, um, you can also subpoena third parties for responsive information. Yeah. <sighs> well, okay, no, that's a good point. No, it's a very good point. I have dealt with this because it's, we're, you know, and invariably you, you have that IT shop that backs up that, that really old system because that's how the database works. And yes, it's seven millimeter tape. You know, like, well, what happens if it breaks? eBay. You know, it's like, dude, I haven't seen a Singer Fryden tape drive in years. Like, I saw this in War Games. Yeah, we bought that one. You know, like, <laughs> like and, and, you know, invariably, you know, working in an IT shop, you know, because it's like, well, we can't get rid of it because, you know, all the coders are dead. And then you have a question of, it is overly burdensome to deliver. Because it's, you know, either you walk in and go, you know, with your banker's box full of 7 millimeter tape going, there you go. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I, I've done that where it's like, hey, can we do this? Because someone said, well, we'll just hire an e-discovery company, like my employer, um, to go and fish this out. And we had one where it was like um, 200 boxes of floppies. And I'm like, okay, I can do this. Oh, but it's Macintosh. Like, I'm a Mac geek. You know, I can. Um, I couldn't find a drive that read 400, 400K Mac floppies. Like, uh, dude, I remember these. Uh, and I'm like calling up like, you know, the old Mac shops going, dude, do you, do you have any like Mac pluses kicking around? How many need? All of them. <laughs> You're like, what formats are, you know, like, and I'm like thinking like, even then, um, wow, this is in, you know, like, this this isn't a word processor that hasn't been coded since eighty seven. I uh, we may not get good data out of this. If you're looking for the smoke and gun, look elsewhere. But okay, um, okay. But back to destruction of evidence. This is often a tempting thing for people. What if I hide it? What if I inadvertently destroy it? Um, no. If you get caught, it gets ugly really fast. There are numerous cases of sanctions in the. Tens of millions of dollars for spoliation of ev for intentional spoliation of evidence. Um, you get sanctions to counsel. Lawyers get lawyers like very cavalier about. Well, this is going to cost the client some money. No, we build a law firm for for if the, if if the lawyer advised the party to destroy the information, that can be disbarment. That can also be a you know multi million dollar fine that the lawyer has to pay. And we don't like paying money. Um, you know, uh, adverse inference instructions. That's a cra that's a legalese term for you can say the evi the absence of evidence is evidence of absence it's evidence we can use that to prove because there's no evidence of this and because they destroyed whatever evidence that may have existed you can argue the opposite to say that did happen that has happened that's terrifying to a lawyer because like all of a sudden you know your argument goes away and the the you know the big one is dismissal claims Yes, you, you did have a valid claim, but because you destroyed the evidence that would have allowed them to defend against that claim, we're dismissing your claim. You know, you're out the money. Gone. Bye. Sorry. Um, I like to think of the discovery attack profile as slow and expensive bleeding. Commercial litigation is like burning pimp rolls of $100 bills and saying, oh yeah, what you got? I got two of them. And you're just burning money. And it's like a chicken game. Um... You're, you're, you're hiring high, uh, you know, very expensive lawyers at three and four and five hundred dollars an hour to sit and bloviate, and it's just burning money until finally someone says this ain't worth it. You know, can, can, can we come to a, can, can we come to a settlement? Um, it used to e-discovery e can get crazy expensive because there are you have attorneys that don't know anything about technology. You have technologists that uh, won't talk to the attorneys, and um, you have people like me who are like. Okay, I have to explain like everyone's a two-year-old, and um, um, which is why. Um
Okay. Uh, the old rules were fairly vague, and um, they so lawyers just not talk about electronically stored information. We, we like paper, boxes and boxes and boxes of memos and paper. Um, and you would you would mention e discovery because the old rules allow like we can look at your databases. That was I think it was data compilation. So you would do that to kind of say fuck you to the other side. And the other side would go okay, you know, we'll, we'll back down. It's sort of a mutually assured, assured destruction. Um, the new rules were clarified which means that every attorney is panicking because the, we don't know what they mean. You know, they're written in stone, but no judge has said what they really mean, so we don't know what they mean. Um, there's mandatory disclosure. Once you're sued or once you sue somebody, you have to start just handing over stuff. And you get to review it to make sure it's not privileged or that it's not relevant, but you just have to start dumping data. And then there's a conference that says, well, formats. You know, you've got that old Singer Fried and tape drive, and you go to the other side and go, do you really want that? Do, uh, you know, it's going to be really expensive for us to give that to you. Are you going to pay us for it? You're going to compensate our costs? Um, and it's the rules are changing really fast. Uh, there's one case called, um, it's Bruner v, I think, Universal, also known as Torrent Spy. Um, it changed a duty to preserve into a duty to collect information. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, dis defenses against discovery. IT stuff. Ability to quickly and efficiently and completely, completely being the operative word, locate and retrieve information. All the information in your shop. I want everything that is relevant to, uh, uh, you know, Jane Smith. Jane Smith was fired. She claims sexual harassment. We, you know, our company claims that she was incompetent. Uh, typical case. Now, we want all the, all the emails. You want to show all the emails that say, Jane's incompetent, Jane's incompetent, Jane's incompetent. She wants all the emails that say, Jane's hot. And th that's how these things break out. Now, of course, because it's electronically stored information, not just emails, not just Word documents, she can ask, I want the voicemails, because that's stored information. And all of a sudden, you're looking for these smoking guns. You're looking for, because you may be able to show, if you're the company, see, I've got all these documents saying she sucked as an employee, and I got five voicemails describing something else. All of a sudden, and of course at that point, you know, once you've found them, all of a sudden people get really interested in settling because you never want to play those in, in an open court. Um, you want to be able to determine, put a price tag when, you know, thinking back to the Singer Fried and tape drive. You say, it's going to cost me $10,000 in, in tech hours and rest necessary equipment to convert all that into straight text. Because that's that's important to say it's overly burdensome. You're suing us for a ten grand problem. You want one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars worth of information. No can do. Um, you want to quickly determine privilege. Flagging emails as like you know, f biggest one is privilege review. Um, I've done a couple of these, and it's reading everybody's email to find out if you emailed an attorney asking for advice. It's like. Why are we doing this? But because we can't show those to the other side because there might be something magical in it. Um, you want to be able to quickly flag stuff that say, this is, this is to corporate counsel about this. All of a sudden, it's no longer discoverable. You want to be able to flag that somehow. Um, archival and indexing solutions so you can quickly do that. I really like search engines that crawl against all your internal data. Um, and you want to be able to have pre preserve that. Once you've been sued or once you're, being su once you're suing somebody, you want to be able to say, we're not deleting anything. All of a sudden, all this data is getting held. If you spool it off to a backup, if you spool it off to a separate litigation server, yeah. Uh, no, no, no. Okay. Interesting question. Does Do you get automatic privilege if you CC the lawyer? No, because it has to be a request for information or, like, what sh dear attorney, what should I do about this? That's asking, that's privileged. Or the attorney responding saying, this is what you should do. If it's all stuff gets CC'd to an attorney, it's not magically privileged. Because I can't say, hey, let's go to lunch. We'll invite Bob. He's in the legal department. Not privileged. Even though you cc the lawyer. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, trade secrets are also privileged, unless, of course, the case is about a trade secret. Yeah, in the back. Right? Uh-huh. 
I'm sorry. What was the question? Oh, oh. It, I don't know what law is making you keep the stuff, so it may be different. I would think that you would want to have a coherent retention policy because that way the important part about it is when you're doing the retention policy, you want to follow it. You want to make sure that five years and one day, are we litigating about this? Nope, put the box in the shredder. But, but nothing goes in the shredder because that way you can say five years and two days, we've been sued. This is all the information. It's gone. Uh, Because that's the scary thing. I talk to lawyers who say, well, I want to hold stuff. And you're like, you're talking about black holding. Um, That's a scary place because it's scarier for people like me because we'll get disbarred. Um, It's not like the client's losing money. Like, I'm losing my license. I have to go back to working in IT. Um, So enforced and rational. You can't... I've I've dealt with some companies that do like a 22-day email retention policy. And that's like doing the mandatory daily change of your password with strong passwords means that post-it notes will hold the password on the monitors like you we know that 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 sort of tension between like really militant like this will protect us and this is just opening another door that we're not thinking about so you want to have them rational but you want them enforced and you want no loopholes you want to make sure that you can say f- you know we hold stuff for five years five years and one day we have a burn party it's gone Okay, legal defenses. There's, you can oppose the discovery order showing costs and burden. However, uh, in the Columbia versus Bunnell or Tarrant Spy, they said, look, it's overly burdensome for us to log IPs that are coming into our web server. They're using IIS. The opposing counsel showed the IIS manual and said, you can turn on logging by clicking this button. So the judge was like, nice try. No. You have to now log IPs because they went in and they tried to argue something that was bullshit. Um, and you, the other legal defense is what I like to call drinking from the fire hose. I'm going to give you so much information you're going to cry. I'm going to increase the cost of litigating this against this by giving you repetitive stuff, giving you um, um, responsive but useless information. Okay, and I want to talk about working together with those bastards in the law department. Um, Pre-discovery. You guys, you know, IT people can quantify the effort to get inaccessible information. How much is it going to cost to pull that data off the, that stack of Mac, old Mac disks or the, the 7 millimeter tape? Um, you can then, le- the law department can then use that information to restrict the discovery or the subpoena. During the discovery, IT can assist in specifying incoming and outcoming discovery methods. Um, Because you get this conference called a Rule 26 conference where you get all the sides together and say, how are we giving you that data? You know, case in point, Company A on a Lotus Notes format, you know, Lotus Notes email, Company B is using Exchange. Well, we can't read those emails. Well, we'll convert them to a third format or we'll convert them to Exchange. And you, you, the IT guy can explain, here's, you know, it's, you know, that's really easy. That's impossible. Let me show you how we can do that. Um, counterattack. Savvy IT person at the Rule 26 conference can call bullshit on the other side. Can call bullshit on, you know, oh, but it'll be so expensive to turn on logging. No, it wouldn't. You know, just it, like, duh, no. And you can be, that's, you can be a really, really useful asset to, to your company by being there and explaining stuff. And of course, you have to explain stuff to like a dumber level than users. Two minutes? Okay. Um, IT and legal work don't, don't work together. You get what I like to call the death spiral where you start hating the other department and everything breaks down. I have some more stories about that. I'll happily tell them in the other room. Uh, Transitive trust. This is, you get the information from the weakest link. Um, B and C hold the same data that you want. You go after whoever is more willing to give you information. Um, the two cases I'm thinking of, and the one that's really important, I think, right now, uh, as anyone, I'm sure some people have heard the Fyodor versus uh, GoDaddy and MySpace issues, where he was hosting passwords to MySpace, and uh, MySpace, instead of going to him and saying, take this down, decided, well, because he'll fight. He might come back at us and say, no, I'm not. Goes to GoDaddy, who says, huh, six bucks a year? Lawsuit. And gone. Poof. So, um, know what information you've got, know what information you share with other people to protect from a transitive attack. Um, have defense agreements that let you work with them to say, look, if someone 
come sniffing at you for information, let us know so we can step in and say, no, 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 you don't, you cannot get that information. Um, if you're in sort of a mutual information sharing, so that way it's like, look, how much, will, how much will you reimburse me to fight this? And you do a contract between the two. Um, jurisdiction issues, can you host information in a nation that grants greater privacy rights? That's becoming a bigger and bigger issue because the Europeans grant far wider privacy rights than we do in the United States. Well, thanks. Um, I think we're pretty close to done, so I'm not sure what the room we're going into, or I, I'm available into, uh, for more, more questions and whatnot. Thank you.